tonight. Tough tariffs. Biden cracks down on China with quadrupled import rates. The high numbers causing tense ties in the backdrop of elections. Keeping close. Putin prepares to meet China's Xi as the two nations bolster ties against looming Western pressure. Protests for Palestine. Palestinians mark 76 years of Nakba as conflict continues to ail those trapped in the West Bank. And puppy power. From shelter to the stage, one energetic ball of fluff proves his worth at Westminster, stealing hearts in the process. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you very much for taking the time to join us on World News Tonight. Let's get you updated on key stories from all across the world without any further ado. Starting off with some tough tariff talks. U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled a bundle of steep tariff increases on an array of Chinese imports, including electric vehicles, computer chips and medical products, risking an election year standoff with Beijing in a bid to woo voters who give his economic policies low remarks. U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled a bundle of steep tariff increases on Tuesday. They're aimed at $18 billion of Chinese imports, including electric vehicles, computer chips and medical products. The White House cited unacceptable risks to U.S. economic security. It said those threats came from unfair Chinese practices, flooding global markets with cheap goods. Biden will raise tariffs this year from 25% to 100% on Chinese-made EVs, among multiple other increased levies. Certain critical minerals will also go from nothing to 25%. More tariffs will follow next year and in 2026 on semiconductors, whose tariff rates will double to 50%. Tariffs on some steel and aluminum products will also take effect this year, the White House said. Official data showed the US imported $427 billion in goods from China last year and exported $148 billion to the world's number two economy. This trade gap has persisted for decades and is an ever more sensitive topic in Washington. The Biden administration further said former President Donald Trump's 2020 trade deal with China did not increase American exports or boost American manufacturing jobs. It also argued the 10% across-the-board tariffs on goods from all points of origin Trump has proposed would frustrate US allies and raise prices. Trump has floated tariffs of 60% or higher on all Chinese goods. Biden administration officials said their measures are carefully targeted and unlikely to worsen inflation. They also downplayed the risk of retaliation from Beijing. Biden has struggled to convince voters of his economic policies despite a backdrop of low unemployment and above-trend economic growth. The president has said he wants to win this era of competition with China but not to launch a trade war. He's worked in recent months to ease tensions in one-on-one -on -one talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping. On Tuesday, China strongly criticised the US decision and it vowed it will take resolute measures to defend its rights and interests. China and the United States also held the first meeting of the Intergovernmental Dialogue on Artificial Intelligence over in Switzerland. During the meeting, China and the United States exchanged views on the technological risks and global governance of AI, measures taken to promote the economic and social development empowered by AI and other issues of respective concern. China stressed that AI technology is the most significant emerging technology at present. China has always upheld a people-centered approach in developing AI and adhered to the principle of developing AI for the good of humanity to ensure that AI technology is beneficial, safe and fair. The Chinese side also made clear its solemn position on the US restrictions and suppression on China in the field of AI. The two sides agreed that the development of artificial intelligence technology faces both opportunities and risks and reaffirmed their commitment to implementing the consensus reached at the San Francisco summit between the two heads of state. 
China says it supports strengthening the global governance of AI, advocates giving full play to the role of the United Nations as the main channel, and is willing to strengthen communication and coordination with the international community, including the United States, to form a global artificial intelligence governance framework and standards with broad consensus. The Chinese leader Xi Jinping will welcome Vladimir Putin to China on Thursday for the Russian president's second visit in less than a year, the latest sign of their growing alignment amid hardening global fault lines as conflict devastates Gaza and Russia makes advances in Ukraine. And for updates on this, we have other than world news special correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. What's the latest, Simashi? Putin will arrive in China just over a week after entering a new term in office extending his autocratic rule until 2030, the result of an election without any true opposition. His visit to Vera, Xi's own state visit to Moscow just over a year ago, where he marked the norm-shattering start of a new term as president like Putin after rewriting rules around how long leaders can serve. Putin will arrive for the two-day state visit emboldened by the survival of his wartime economy and a major, major new offensive along key point of the front line in Ukraine. For she is freshly returned from a European tour, the visit is an opportunity to showcase that his alliance to Putin has not broken his ability to engage with the West. Back to you, Anravi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Semashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. We're on the Israel-Palestine conflict now. Just a day after Israeli protesters wrecked trucks carrying humanitarian supplies, Palestinian truckers said they feared for the security of aid convoys on their way to Gaza. These trucks were carrying humanitarian supplies bound for Gaza, now strewn across the road in the occupied West Bank as the enclave faces a severe hunger crisis. Palestinian hauliers said on Tuesday they feared for the security of aid convoys to Gaza, a day after Israeli protesters wrecked the trucks. Videos circulating on social media on Monday showed protesters throwing supplies from the trucks at the Tarkimiya checkpoint. The head of the Hebron Food Trade Association said Israeli soldiers stood by as the attack took place. Adele Imar is from the West Bank-based Hauliers Union. We went to the checkpoint and after the checks we were surprised to see settlers on the roundabout of the checkpoint. They damaged the cars, they tore the tires off the trucks, they threw the contents of the trucks on the ground. We gathered some of the products and sent some of those products on to a bulldozer and sent them to sheep farms. Around 15 trucks were damaged, their hull was damaged, windows of trucks were broken, some drivers were beaten, some of the products were thrown away and the whole loss for Hebron is around $2 million. Amar said some drivers are now refusing to take goods to Gaza because they are afraid. A group calling itself Order 9 has claimed Monday's attack and says it acted to stop supplies reaching Hamas, accusing the Israeli government of giving gifts to the Islamist group. Palestinians and human rights groups have accused the Israeli military and police of deliberately failing to intervene when settlers attack Palestinians in the West Bank. The violent protest drew condemnation from the U.S., which has urged Israel to step up deliveries of aid into Gaza. Britain's foreign minister also condemned the, quote, appalling incident, saying Israel must call the attackers to account. No comment was available from the Israeli military. The Israeli police said a number of people were arrested and the incident was being investigated. Meanwhile, Palestinians across the Middle East are marking the anniversary of the mass expulsion from what is now Israel with protests and other events across the region at a time of mounting concern over the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. On the 76th anniversary of what Palestinians call the Nakba, Israeli Arabs demonstrate in villages depopulated during the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. Residents of these villages in northern Israel fled their homes when fighting broke out and were later prevented from returning by Israeli troops. The current conflict in Gaza was also on their minds. Palestinians were displaced within the new state of Israel and 700,000 fled beyond its borders. 
like this man who still lives in the West Bank refugee camp where he arrived as a child. We left the village of Sabarin on May 12, 1948, and we came to the Janine area because our village was close to Janine. They transferred us to the Nur Shams refugee camp, where we lived in tents for six years. After that, they built small houses for us that could accommodate two or four people, and we continued to live in the Nur Shams camp until today. People in Gaza also marked an Akba day. More than one and a half million have been displaced in the seven months of war, and some see life in the coastal enclave as history repeating itself. Palestinians have long called for the right to return to the homes they lived in before 1948. For people in Gaza, just returning to their current homes is still a long way off. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The heat continues to cause concern in neighboring nations. Now, villagers in the North Parganas district of India's West Bengal state were facing a severe weather shortage as an intense heat wave scorched the area, drying up most water sources. Many of the wells where villagers typically source their water have dried up and become non-functional, except for one remaining pump to which some have walked multiple kilometers to reach. They added that the primary source of water for the area, a large pond, was drying up and levels were only ankle deep. With most parts of India reeling from high temperatures, the weather department has forecast an unusually high number of heatwave days for April to June, with the Gangetic Bengal Plains where the North Paraganas district is located, being some of the most severely affected regions. And on the road to the White House tonight, in the lead up to the election schedule for November, three U.S. states, Maryland, Nebraska and West Virginia, voted in the presidential primaries, further shaping the expected Joe Biden versus Donald Trump fight. Here's a look at the somewhat predictable numbers. In Maryland, Donald Trump is projected to win after securing all 37 delegates via 80.1% of the votes. He was followed by Nikki Haley, who received around 47,513 votes. Among Democrats, U.S. President Joe Biden is a projected winner, with 79 of the 95 delegates from Maryland. As with the report, he received 86.3%, followed by 47,108 votes to uncommitted. Going head-to-head, -head, Trump and Biden emerged victorious in their respective party presidential primaries in West Virginia. While Joe Biden won all 20 Democrat delegates with 67,064 votes, Donald Trump, with 195,069 votes, gained all 32 Republican delegates. In the state of Nebraska, with over 95% of the votes in, Joe Biden has emerged as the projected winner of the Democratic Party presidential primaries. Donald Trump has also won the Nebraska presidential primary election. With over 80.2% votes, he was allocated 36 of 36 delegates. And now some updates involving the investigation into the deadly bridge collapse in Baltimore. The NTSB issuing its preliminary report on the cargo ship that slammed into the bridge. Reports now revealing that the ship hours before it even left the port had two other major power outages and two blackouts hours later crashing into the bridge. This morning, the port of Baltimore. Now one step closer to fully reopening after a powerful controlled explosion brought down the largest remaining section of the key bridge. Crews used small precision explosives to cut through the giant steel trusses safely and efficiently, sending the massive structure tumbling off the cargo ship, the Dolly, and into the water. We're now very close to fully clearing the channel. And we're already getting large ships in and out of the port of Baltimore. The Dolly has been stuck for seven weeks after crashing into the bridge and sending it thundering down. There's last reported at least several vehicles in the water with several people still on account for. Killing six construction workers. On the surface and underwater now, crews are assessing the area, hoping to move that ship back to port within 48 hours. 
Even then, the ship's crew will remain on board. They're critical to repair efforts as well as to multiple investigations. There's still more wreckage obstructing the port. Crews are working around the clock to finish the job, aiming to fully clear the channel by the end of this month. Huge throngs of protesters blocked streets in the capital of Georgia and milled angrily outside the parliament building after lawmakers approved a foreign influence bill that critics call a Russian-style threat to free speech and the country's aspiration to join the European Union. It triggered some of the largest protests in the country's history. Yet Georgia's prime minister said the foreign influence law, which was passed by parliament on Tuesday, reflected the will of the majority and therefore of the people. Earlier in the day, scuffles broke out in parliament between ruling party and opposition MPs as the law was approved in its third reading. The announcement was met with outrage by a crowd gathered outside the building, yet many vowed to keep up their protest movement. Critics say the law, which requires media and advocacy groups receiving over 20% of their funding from abroad to register as pursuing the interests of a foreign power, can easily be abused to silence dissent and fear it will see Georgia drift closer to Russia. Both Brussels and Washington have repeatedly warned it could derail the country's EU membership bid and affect relations with the West. A small if. Georgia's president said she would refuse to sign off on the bill, but her veto can easily be overridden by another vote in parliament. More civil unrest is ensuing. Three people were killed and hundreds more injured. Shops were looted and public buildings were torched during a second night of rioting in New Caledonia as anger over constitutional reforms from Paris boiled over. Adopted by a majority of French lawmakers, the bill allows French residents who have lived in New Caledonia for 10 years to vote in local elections. Indigenous people on the island, many of whom favour independence from France, fear the bill will dilute their political power. The debate sparked the worst violence in 40 years on the French-ruled Pacific Island. In a letter addressed to New Caledonian officials, Macron called for calm and said the constitutional reform would be adopted this summer at a special session of Congress unless loyalist and pro-independence parties could agree on a fresh text. I invite New Caledonia's political leaders to take France's outstretched hand and come to Paris for discussions in the coming weeks. The important thing is a return to calm. The important thing is dialogue. The important thing is to build a common, political and global solution. Violence is neither justifiable nor tolerable. In the capital, Noumea, riots rage on for a second consecutive night. On Tuesday night, buildings like this gymnasium were vandalized and set alight. And stores like this one ransacked by looters. Cars, houses and shops have been torched, leading to food shortages in some neighbourhoods. Over 130 people were arrested as police clashed with heavily armed rioters. Scores of police officers have also been wounded. The violence has prompted local authorities to impose a curfew and shut down schools and the airport as security reinforcements from metropolitan France are en route to New Caledonia to help restore order. Still with France updates now, French police continued a manhunt to capture the gunman and the escaped prison inmate that attacked a prison van. Gunman wearing balaclavas ambushed a prison van in northern France to free a drug dealer known as the Fly, killing two prison guards, severely wounding three and triggering a major police manhunt. The present morning attack at a toll booth in Incarville in the Eure region of northern France underlines the growing threat of drug crime across Europe, the world's number one cocaine market. The fugitive inmate, named Mohamed Amra, is a 30-year-old drug dealer from northern France, according to the Paris Prosecutor's Office and police sources. He had been convicted of burglary by a court in Evry on May 10th and was being held at the Val de Rui prison. Amra had also been indicted by prosecutors in Marseille for a kidnapping that led to a death. Amra was a drug dealer with Thai Sioux City's powerful Blacks gang. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
Some puppy pride is in store for us tonight as we bring to you a true success story. From shelter stray to being a scene stealer, Miles the dog set out to conquer the prestigious Westminster Dog Show and in the process stole everyone's hearts as well. This dog is stealing America's collective heart. Miles is a seven-year-old shelter dog who now finds himself at the world's most prestigious dog show, Westminster. He's part lab, part hound. In other words, an all-American mutt. Miles' owner, Christine Longnecker, found him at a Pennsylvania animal shelter where he was at the bottom of the adoption list. They said that he was aggressive, that he couldn't be around other dogs, kids humans, cats, anything. Christine knew Miles deserved a chance. Her gamble paid off. With Christine's guidance, this underdog began competing in agility competitions, <laughs> making it all the way to Westminster. Look at him go. Miles didn't win this year, coming in fourth. Meanwhile, the purebreds competing this year for best in show are getting all the pampering a show dog could ever need. Regardless of winning the actual competition or not, Miles did definitely deserve an award for being a very good boy. Well, that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.